All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another lecture by the Douglasville class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and his eternal purpose operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We owe classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Douglasville branch was established in 2014. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to school official. The vice president is Dr. Dotson Wallace. In this school, we use the true correct original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifested in the inner out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each uh, God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that the creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation or your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the, neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters in their alphabet that will produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was the letter A in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of our Heavenly Father and His Son's name. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized on our chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of the chart to show you that everything on the charts are within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within a pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having a shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, his self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know his name, know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of his name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. We call it the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court that goes round about. These three compartments, make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the threefold structure and function of the tabernacle pattern. And that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional aims and objectives of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures 
comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. A, to uh, earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered into the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, save in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. At this time, we'll have class dedicated in prayer by me, Dr. Najee Williams. Then we'll have our scripture lesson read, Philippians, the first chapter, by Dr. Dotson Wallace. Heavenly Father Yahweh, we ask that you show us your purpose, pattern, and plan more perfectly in these last days, as the days are evil. We ask that you keep us from the evil and keep us in your son, Yahshua the Messiah. With these few words, let us all say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, class. Good evening. I'll be reading Philippians, the first chapter from the Holy Name Bible containing the holy name version of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association. Philippians, the first chapter can be found in the back of the holy name Bible on page 262. Saul and Timothy, the servants of Yahshua the Messiah, to all the sons in Yahshua the Messiah, which are in Philippi, Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from Yahweh our Father and from the Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. I thank my Elohim upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Yahshua the Messiah. Even as it is fitting for me to think this of you all, because you have me in your heart. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of this grace with me. For Yahweh is my witness, how greatly I long after you all in the affection of Yahshua the Messiah. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may examine the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of the Messiah, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Yahshua the Messiah unto the glory and praise of Yahweh. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in the Messiah are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Messiah waxing confident my by my bounds are much more bold to speak the word without fear some indeed preach the messiah even of the envy and strife and some also of goodwill the one preached the messiah of contention 
not sincerity, supposing to add affection to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, the Messiah is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Yahshua the Messiah, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also the Messiah shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is the Messiah, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is to me the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. For I am in a straight betwixt, betwixt the two. For I am in a straight betwixt the two. I would prefer the returning and be with the Messiah, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Yahshua and Messiah for me by my coming to you again. Only let your behavior be as it, is, as it becometh the evangel of the Messiah, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And be not terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of Elohim, for unto you is for, for unto you it is given in the behalf of the Messiah not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. That was Philippians, the first chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to thank everybody for tuning in and thank everybody that is on YouTube. Uh, for tuning in and thank everybody that uh, has joined us in the Zoom session today. Our scripture readers for this today's session will be Dr. Carol Dye and Dr. Dotson Wallace. And for our first speaker, it's an honor and a pleasure to call on um, Dr. Janice Walker from our Muskegon, Michigan branch. Good evening. Good evening. Lee, you're going to have to hold your voice down. I'm having class. Uh, peace in Yashua, everyone. Uh, it's always good for me to be here. Thank Yahweh for waking me up every day and to be able to come to class and to learn about his purpose, pattern, and plan unto salvation, which the knowledge and wisdom and the understanding that he has bestowed upon us that we may still be able to learn about our creator as he really is and actually exists. Um, let me have uh, John 17 and one, please. John, the 17th chapter and the first verse. These words take Yahshua. And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Okay, now he said, these words spake Yahshua. If you have a red letter edition in your Bible, that you will see that that's in red letters. And Yahshua is doing the speaking, which is the only true savior of the world. The one that died on the cross for your sins and for mine and for the entire world. Now he's speaking unto the heavenly father which we know that Yahweh and Yahshua is one. So he's speaking right within himself. Read. 
glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Now he's praying a prayer unto the father, and he's asking the father to glorify thy son, which is Yahweh Elohim, the only begotten son, which is Yahshua the Messiah manifested in the flesh. Read. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And see, Yahweh has manifested power in that physical body of Yahshua the Messiah to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given over unto him. Now, through Yahshua the Messiah, you can inherit eternal life. And we're not talking about in the flesh because we know the flesh cannot live forever. We're talking about something that's manifested in the body. You're made spirit, soul, and body. And we're talking about that soul that's going to inherit eternal life according to the will of Yahweh, whom he have chosen to give over to the son, Yahshua, the Messiah. Read. And this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. See, now, this is the clear-cut definition of what eternal life is. And the one that's going to give you eternal life is the only one that can tell you what it is. That's just like when you uh, meet someone, and the first thing that you ask them, well, my name is so-and-so, and then you ask them, what's your name? Okay, and then if you want to know anything about that person, you have to ask that person. That person can tell you about himself, not what somebody else then told you about that person, but he can tell you more about him or herself. So Yahshua is telling you what eternal life is because he's the only one that can give you eternal life. He say eternal life is that you know the Father who is Yahweh, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua, the Messiah, whom the Father has sent. Now, that's showing you right there. That's the unity of the Father, which a lot of people read this, but they don't understand it. It's showing you Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. These three are one. And that's eternal life is for you to know Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua, how that these three are one, a unity. See, we live in a universe, not a triniverse. He is one. And the manifestation in pure spirit, which you cannot see, he's the source, substance, limits and bounds of everything, all things. But then he took on the superincorporeal form as <laughs> Yahweh Elohim, and he created the creation by the pattern of himself, which is Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe. So that the creation is operating exactly according to the pattern that he set up from the foundation of the world. Everything is that threefold pattern, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one, and nothing escapes that pattern. So if you want to inherit eternal life, you need to know who the one is that's going to give eternal life. So that should be your main goal is to find out who the one that's got eternal life so I can know who that is so I know who to get it from. Because other people will offer you things, just like back in the days, you remember they used to have name brand canned goods and then they came out with that black and white canned goods was that no name brand you know that was something Yahweh was showing us because Lord God of Jesus Christ that's written in black that's the no name because Lord is not a name God is not a name and Jesus is definitely not a name it's uh, a deity that people have took on as a name but it ain't really a name you know, it's, if you find out there was no letter J in the Hebrew, Greek, or Latin language, and then his name was never given to him in the late Latin, the Greek, but his name was given to him way before they even came up with the letter J. The letter J was the last letter added to the alphabet, but they inserted it in the middle to try to trick you. But let's read on. Now, um, Doc, pick up the 10th verse, please. John 17 and 10. And all mine are thine. Mm -hmm. And thine are mine. 
and I am glorified in them. See, and I am glorified in them because mm -hmm. you'll find out later when you read in the Law and the Prophets that it was talking about Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, those was his two witnesses. Now see, glorified in them because Yahweh is going to put the spirit of all men, his spirit, if you're living, you have the spirit of Yahweh in you. All men that is living, all things that are living, has the manifest, is manifest the spirit of Yahweh in you, but everyone do not have Yahshua, which is the Holy Spirit in them. Okay, read. And now I am no more in the world, mm -hmm. but these are in the world. Mm -hmm. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. See, that they may be one as we are. And that's what we're looking forward to, is inherit the eternal life that we may be one in that one body, which is Yahshua Messiah. I'm not talking about the Holy Flesh. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit being one in that body. Okay, Doc, give me Exodus, the second chapter. Exodus 2. And 1, please. And 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Okay, hold it right there. Now, it was a man of Levi and a woman of Levi or his wife. And they conceived and had a son. See, back in the law that you had to have, you couldn't deal with the outsiders of, of another uh, generation. You had to be within your own generation. Okay, so he had, uh, the mother was a Levi and the father was a Levi and they had a son, okay? Now, if uh, we have depicted up in the first chapter, it was Pharaoh who issued out a death decree. And see, let's pick that up so I won't jump. We got time. Go to uh, Exodus 1 and, uh, 1 and maybe uh, 15. All right. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shephora, and the name of the other was Pua. Mm -hmm. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Okay, now Pharaoh issued out a death decree to the Hebrew midwives. And they told them, now when you see them on the birth stool delivered, if it be a son, you kill it. But if it be a daughter, you keep it alive. Because you need a male and a female to bring forth children. So now they, he tried to kill off all the boy babies and just have the women's. Okay, read. But the midwives feared Elohim and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them. But now, save see, the men, if you, children. If you look at it, see, they fear Elohim way back then, even though they didn't even know who he was, because the fact is that they was worshiping all kinds of different gods and idols and stuff. But see, they feared one that they didn't even know who he really was. Read. 18. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, why have you done this thing? Now go back to 17, Doc, because you didn't finish that. Oh, I'm sorry. But the midwives feared Elohim and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Now you see you got some salvation right there, but save the male children alive. Okay? And now you know Back in the days, if you didn't do what a king say, he'll have your head cut off or have you put in a dungeon, ate by a lion or something. But see, you can now see Yahweh is operating right here, dealing with these Hebrew midwives. Read. 
And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore Elohim dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared Elohim, that he made them houses. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Now here you go with another death. Say, okay, because the Hebrew women, before we even get to them, they had already delivered the baby. Okay, so he going to issue out another death decree. He going to say, well, dear, you cast them in the river. It, since you didn't kill them uh, when they was born, then you cast them in the river. Okay, we're going to see who going to operate now. Go ahead and read two and one, please. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Okay. Now she said when she saw this son, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now, when have you known a baby be born and you can tell they're going to be good? Is it because <laughs> they sleep a lot? Is it because they don't cry a lot? But see, we looking at principles. So the principle we see, we see three. A principle, Father, Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Okay, read. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Now, she laid him in the flags by the river's brink, but she put him in an ark of bulrushes. Okay, back then, those ark, when they sealed it, they didn't have concrete or cement, you know, stuff like they have now. But the ark, it was sealed, and it did not leak. And they put the, he put the child, she put the child in it, and they put it by the flags of the, the rivers now. Okay, it said by the brinks, but that's like the cattails. You know, you ain't gonna just put your baby in the middle of the river. And then, you know, with waves and stuff going on and sharks and alligators or whatever back then. No, it was in the cattails. And then it moved, it moved very slow through that. Read. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Mm -hmm. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flats, she sent her maid to fetch it. Mm -hmm. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. Okay, she hold it right there. Now, we got a death, a death decree. We got the child buried in the ark. And then here the uh, Pharaoh's daughter come and she's out there in the water washing herself. And then she sees the ark and she told one of her maids to go fetch this ark. Now, Moses' sister is watching this the whole entire time. She's following right along the side of the river's brink, watching what's going to happen to this ark. Okay, a witness right there seeing what's going to happen to her brother, right? And she opened the ark and the child wept. Okay, now that's in fulfillment uh, with Yahshua say Yahshua wept because he's fulfilling all things. Okay, he is the ark of salvation. You know, he was uh, the, uh, he was a Jew or a Hebrew manifested in the flesh. Okay, for Philip, Moses was a Hebrew of the Levite, Levitical priesthood because his mother and father was a Levite. And later on, you find out that Moses would be of the Levitical priesthood, him and his brother Aaron. Okay, now read. And she had compassion on him 
and said, this is one of the Hebrew's children. Okay, now this is one of the Hebrew children. So we got a death, a burial, a resurrection when she takes him out of the ark. Okay, and then we got three month old. That's a, a three, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and a three, like a third day resurrection with Yahshua the Messiah. He died, he was buried, he resurrected, he, he resurrected the third day, he ascended to the Father. Okay, read. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me. And I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Okay. Now, Pharaoh's, um, Moses' sister asked her. Now, here's a Hebrew talking to an Egyptian, right? You know, and she's telling, do you want me to take this child to be nursed? Because Pharaoh's daughter hadn't had no child, so she didn't have any uh, milk to feed this child. She said, yeah, and I will pay you. Wages, you know, to, to take this child to be fed. Now, of course, that's a sister. So what's she going to do? She's going to take Moses back home to his mother. And here she is seeing her child when she thought she would never see her child again. Look how Yahweh operates. And then she feeds and then she get paid to nurse and take care of her own child. Now, that's the first incident of ADC or welfare being set up. Getting paid to take care of your own child. Now, then the child, he, she brought her, she brought him back unto Pharaoh's daughter, and she named the child Moses because Hebrew children are named due to their characteristics, and it means because I draw you out. So she named him Moses. But Yahweh already had that preordained way back here in the foundation that his name was going to be called Moses, but it had to be manifested in the flesh by Pharaoh saying, Moses, because I drew you out. See, Yahweh will put something within a person's heart and mind, what he already got planned. But then we have to see the manifestation when they speak it. Okay, now read. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian, smited an Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now I say when Moses was grown, so Moses was 40 years old. So there's another principle right there of 40. Now we have blood, water, spirit, and 40. Okay. Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Okay. Now he was grown and here he is going out amongst his brethren. Now, his brethren is the Hebrews, okay? And he's also raised up in the Egyptian house. So Moses got two families. He's raised up with the Egyptians, and he's considered an Egyptian, but he was born a Hebrew. So he has two families, okay? Read. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Okay, and he looked this way and that way, and he saw that nobody was looking, and he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, here is Moses being a mediator between brethren that's fighting, but here he is, he slew one. And we don't read it, but we've been told that that was uh, Pharaoh's son that Moses slew. So there was a part of Moses' family from the uh, Egyptians and a part of uh, Moses' family from the Hebrews. But of course, he took the side of the Hebrew because he knew what his original um, family was. 
Okay, and he hid him in the sand. Now, he killed him, there's a death. He buried him, he hid him in the sand. Read. 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to them that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thy, thou thy fellow? And he said, who made thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest, killedest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Okay, now, now hold it right there. Now, the two. Now you see two of his brethren of the Hebrews fighting against one another. And then the one said, "Is tennis you gonna kill me like you killed the Egyptian the other day?" So the one that's saying that is the one that Moses saved his life from the Egyptian killing him. So he killed the Egyptian. That's how he knew it because then Moses looked this way and that way. He didn't see nobody. And then he killed the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. But that one that was there was a witness to what Moses did. Now he's speaking against Moses while Moses trying to stop two Hebrew or two Hebrew brethren from fighting. Okay, Moses said, this thing is surely known. So what Moses got to do? Read. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Okay, so there it is, a resurrection. Moses fleed for his life because he knew that Pharaoh would kill him. Even though Pharaoh was, as, uh, as is, his grandfather, he was going to kill him because of the Egyptian that Moses killed. Okay, so Moses had to leave. And what did he do? He fled out of, out of Egypt, and this happened in the, like in the wilderness of Sinai. And then here he is fleeing into the land of Midian. Okay. The land of Midian, it would be like into in the most holy place. So you got one, two, three. Father, word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Okay. Read. Um, 16. 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Now, there's another principle of seven. We got seven days of creation. We got seven steps in the tabernacle. You know, that seven can run. And you got seven ages and dispensations. You got seven ages, seven dispensations. You know, that principle of seven can run on and on. So there are seven. Why couldn't be eight daughters? Why couldn't be three daughters? But it was seven because we always got to look for that pattern in operation. Read. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Rurel, their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? Okay. And now here they is. Um, harassing these women that was out there watering their flock. Here's Moses interceding again as a mediator, type and shadow of a mediator, and he run them off. Now, one man run off a, a whole bunch of men that's uh, messing with these women that's watering their flock. Look at the power of Yahweh operating in that one body of Moses. See, it say, if you got Yahweh on your side, you ain't got to worry about nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Because Yahweh will take care of it all with the manifestation that he shows man that he can operate in a body. Read. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Okay, hold it right there. Now they said he was Egyptian. So was Moses a Hebrew or was he Egyptian? Well, he had on Egyptian clothes because that's where he was raised up at in the um, in Egypt. So he had, a, but he was actually a Hebrew, and he knew what his what his uh, generation was originally of because when he raised up by his parents his original parents and then he was taken back 
to the Egyptians' uh, ways of life, Pharaoh's daughter. So he knew what he was. He knew he was a Hebrew, but he wore the attirements of the Egyptians. So they only saw what um, he had on and say he was an Egyptian. Okay, and he said, well, where is he? You know, bring him unto me that we may feed him because this man didn't help y'all because these uh, other men, they could have killed y'all and took my flock and all of that. So bring this man into a house. Let me meet him, Read. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zephorah, his daughter. Now see, look at there. For a good deed that he did, he gave him his daughter. Okay, now say Jephro Ruel, uh, El Ru. That's why I see with, you know, his father in the law, Elohim in the law. I am with you always, even to the end of the world, because it's Yahweh operating by a pattern. Okay, now let's uh, go over here to Exodus 3 and 1. Exodus, the third chapter, first verse. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. Now here he is, still dealing with a flock. So it's like uh, Moses is a shepherd. He's still dealing with a flock. Okay, now he already then got a wife from Jethro, his father-in-law. He then gave him a wife, and then here he is still tending to his sheep. Okay, because he up here uh, in the land of Midian, because he ain't going back down there in the land of Egypt because Pharaoh seek his life. So he got a wife, he got a home, he got a job, you know, so he doing well up there. Okay, and then right here, up here, Moses is uh, 80 years old, if I'm mistaken. He's uh, 80 years old right here. Okay, read. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Mm -hmm. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now here Moses is out here tending to his sheep, you know, mind his own business, and then he comes into this bush. Okay, now this bush is burning with fire, but the bush is not being consumed. Now, Moses has saw many bushes out there, you know, but this one particular bush have drawn his attention. So here he is, and the bush is not being consumed. Now, he see an angel in this bush. Now, on the board... Okay, well, usually we have board. Okay, you see, an angel of Yahweh appeared, right? So we got an angel appeared. Read, Doc. Third verse, and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. Okay, now Moses is looking at this bush. He's looking at this angel in this bush, but he said, I'm going to turn aside to see this bush. Now, a carnal-minded person would think that Moses turned his head aside because he's afraid of this bush. But now what he did, he turned away his thoughts, his opinions, his imagination so he can see this. Now we know as Joshua's, we know that Moses is having a vision right within himself. Just like when you dream at night or when you take a nap or whatever and you dream, that vision is happening within you. Your soul have left that body and it's gone over here to Las Vegas, and it's over here at the casino, and it's hitting slots left and right, winning all kind of money, but you land there in your bed. See, that's what a vision can do. That's what Moses did. He left his thoughts, his opinion, his imaginations, his body, he left it there so he can see what this is really happening. So this is what Yahweh can do, show you a vision. Leave your body right there and show you a vision right within yourself. Okay, read. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, mm -hmm. Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and okay. said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Okay, the angel appeared and then Yahweh Elohim called unto him. So you got an angel and you got Yahweh Elohim, which is the word of son, called him by name, Moses, Moses. 
Now I say, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, because Yahweh is the all-seeing eye, he searches the heart and the mind. So he knew he had Moses' attention, okay? And so he called unto him, and he called him by name, okay? And he said, here am I, read. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he said, where, where you stand, see, standing in the presence of Yahweh, you're going to bear your soul. When you when Yahweh chose you and brought you in this gospel and sit you down in them hard seats and made you see this vision as it really is and actually exists and start making you understand what this gospel was about, you was bearing your soul right then and there. Okay, and so that's what we're doing now. We're bearing our soul because we want our souls to be saved. And that's what we eternal life is, is to know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. And that he is salvation, which is Joshua the Messiah. We are bearing our souls before Yahweh. Okay, and that's what Moses did. And he said, what? He said, the place where thou standest is holy ground because you're in the presence of Yahweh. When you're in the presence of this gospel, See, it's holy because Yahweh is all in all. You know, this gospel is a panoramic vision that Yahweh gave unto Dr. Henry Clifford Kennedy in the year 1931. Mind you that everything that you see on these charts, they already had taken place back in the previous ages. But Yahweh is letting us see it today. We weren't back there. We weren't born back there. Dr. Kinley wasn't even born back there when Moses was here at the burning bush or the children of Israel was in the wilderness of Sinai or any one of those prophets that was going on in the ages, the ages before this fourth age. But Yahweh taking us all the way back like he did Moses and letting us see even the angelic creation, you know, the things that was going on and that how it was set up. See, we see in this vision. And Yahweh has opened up our hearts and minds and making us understand it. This is what the true gospel is. That stuff that's out there in the world, ain't no truth in it whatsoever. It's fake, falsified, and generic. And see, we got to stand still in this true gospel because we got what the world wants. We got what some of those prophets back in the ages that they wanted to see, but Yahweh didn't purpose for them to see it like we see it in this fourth age because this is the end of the flesh and we seeing it as it really is. Okay, Doc, finish read. Six verse, moreover, he said, I am the Elohim of thy father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac and the Elohim of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. Now, see, he's telling him who he is. Now, he said, I am the Elohim of your fathers, Amram and, and Joshebek, um, Isaac, Jacob, you know, um, of your forefathers, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, I am the Elohim of them. Now, mind you, this is in the third age. Now, Abraham was already uh, born, right? Abraham was already born. Um, let's see, where that chart? Um, yeah, Abraham was before Moses, right? Abraham was before Moses. Abraham had a son. His son's name was Isaac. And then Isaac's name was changed to Jacob. Nope. Wait a minute. Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and that's Jacob. Right. Israel. Yeah, changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. Right. Okay. Now he's telling you, I am the, the Five minutes. okay, Five the minutes. forefathers yeah. of them. Right. Of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of your forefathers. That's who I am. Okay, read. And Moses was afraid. Excuse me, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. Now see, he's afraid to look upon Elohim. Okay, now jump down to uh the ninth verse. A ninth verse. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. Mm -hmm. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Okay, hold it right there, Doc. Now, here he is. He promised Abraham way back. He said, 
I will bless thy seed. I will multiply that seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand upon the seashore. But first they had to go down to a land that they knew not of and be held in bondage. And I, Yahweh, would deliver them. So those are the 12 tribes of Israel. And they was down there multiplied in the land of Egypt. Okay. Now, mind you, Moses was scared to go back down. And now he said he was afraid to look upon Elohim because now he's seeing the power. Now, see, um, in the fourth chapter, you read how Yahweh gave him some demonstrations of what his name meant. But we ain't going to have time to get that. Okay, read on, Doc. In verse, come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. Now, he didn't say go down, Moses. You remember we used to sing that song back in the days? Go down, Moses, way down, Moses, in Egypt. Uh-uh. He said, come now. I'm down here, and I want you to come down here where I'm at. You might be afraid, but guess what? I got your back. So you come now, therefore, down here in the land of Egypt where I'm at. Okay, read. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now he's telling you, I'm going to send you unto Pharaoh, and you're going to bring my people. It didn't say Moses' people. It was his people, Yahweh. Yahweh always take care of his people. Okay? Now, we're running out of time, so let's jump down to... Go ahead. We're going to read on, Doc. And Moses said unto Yahweh, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. And he says, Certainly, I will be with thee. Mm -hmm. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. Mm -hmm. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve Elohim upon this mountain. Mm -hmm. And Moses said unto Yahweh, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now they're going to ask, What is his name? Because there's many gods down in the land of Egypt. And he said, What is his name? What should I say unto them? Well, right here, he already had told them, I am the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob. Now, Elohim means, um, I, Elohim is a divine title. You know, I will be, I will be with thee. That's what he had told them. But see, now he's got to give him a name. Okay, read. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Aya, Asher, Aya. Now, that's not a name. But in there, you see, that a ya as er asher a ya i will be what i will to be and he's gonna later on demonstrate that that's not yahweh's name but that's what his name means i will be what i will to be okay now yahweh is all in all and that's all now he has two manifestations as super incorporeal form as yahweh elohim and then manifest himself in the flesh as yahshua the messiah okay read on and he said thus shalt thou say to the children of israel i will be have sent me unto you and yahweh said moreover unto moses this thus shalt thou say unto the children of israel yahweh the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Okay, he said, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Yahweh gave Moses his name. And his name, his name will remain the same unto all generations. Aren't we a generation in this fourth age? We are a generation, and his name must remain the same. It would never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future. Father, Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. His name don't change. And so forth on as the name that he manifested as Yahshua the Messiah, it don't change. Yahshua fulfilled all things in the law and the prophets. And his name is salvation. I'd like to encourage everyone to continue in this only true gospel and learn all that you can and get all the getting that you can get out of this gospel because Yahweh is about to take it out.
Everyone stay in peace and stay strong in Yahshua. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Janice Walker. For our next speaker, it's an honor and a pleasure to call on Dr. Iris Jones. Good evening, class. And it's really good to be here with all of you this evening. You know, I, I truly enjoyed the previous speaker. Dr. Walker took us through the purpose of Yahweh starting the way our teacher always teaches us by going back to Moses and bringing out and pointing out those types and shadows and principles that show his purpose. And if it be his will, I would hope to continue along the lines where, where she was. Okay, we were at Moses, and he was being told that he was going to come back down into the land of Egypt, and he was going to tell the children of Israel and Pharaoh that Yahweh said they had to come up out of the land of Egypt and, and worship him at that mount, which was Mount Sinai. Now, Moses had some objections to that command to go back down into Egypt. And he offered Yahweh his objections, talking about he didn't speak well. Um, he knew that there was a man that was dead by results of his hand, and he didn't want to go back and face that. But Yahweh gave him some reassurance. He told him, certainly, I will be with you. You see, and he, Moses goes back down there and he does what Yahweh tells him to do. Now, Dr. Walker spent some time talking to us or, or showing us in the scriptures about that angel that was in the bush and Elohim was in the bush and Yahweh spoke to Moses and you see the one that Moses recognized in the midst of that bush was down there in the land of Egypt he went to that same one and that one is the one who gave him the instructions on what to go to Pharaoh and say well he, he told it to Aaron and Aaron was his mouthpiece. And everything that Yahweh Elohim gave him instructions to say, that's what he did. And Yahweh totally destroyed the mightiest nation on the face of the earth with 10 devastating plagues. You see, the first three was on everybody. The Egyptians as well as the Hebrews. You see, but the last seven were only on the Egyptians. And you see, Yahweh tore down all their gods, everything that they worshiped, everything that they thought brought them good fortune or, or was good to them in some kind of way, whether it fertile the land or, or whatever the case may be. He took it away from them. See, they worshiped the sun and it was dark over the whole face of the earth. The Hebrews had light in Goshen. You see, they worshiped their children. The firstborn of both man and beast died. They worshiped their cattle. They got sick and died. I, everything that they thought that they had going for them, Yahweh took it away from them. And then he killed Pharaoh, you see. And he took them to and through the divided waters of the Red Sea. Now, we're going to go to um, Exodus, the 12th chapter. And let's start reading at the first verse. 
You see, and, because and, some and, things happen. Excuse me. There's some things that happened before he took them that three day journey to and through the divided waters of the Red Sea. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Exodus 12 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it from take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Okay, and Can I stop you right there. Stop. Now you see. The previous speaker talked about the salvation of a soul. They're taking out that sacrifice according to the number of souls in that household. You see, it had to that lamb had to be completely consumed. So you wanted to get the right size lamb. Now, if your house was too big for your household, then you got together with your next door neighbor or, or another neighbor who could make that lamb, I mean, who would completely consume that lamb, but it had to be completely consumed. And if any of it remained, they had to burn it. You see, now Yahweh gives them specific instructions down there in the land of Egypt. He didn't do any less with Pharaoh. He told Pharaoh, you got to let them go so they can come up and worship me at this mount. No, you can't keep their flocks. No, you can't keep their women and children. They all got to go. Well, you know, that didn't work out when Pharaoh wanted to, to bargain. Yahweh said, this is how it has to go. With the children of Israel coming up out of bondage, they had to do it just that way. You take out a lamb on the tent. You hold it over till the 14th. Now, they didn't know one month for the next, but Yahweh saying, this is unto you the beginning of month. It's the first month of the year to you. You see, you're going to take a male lamb out on the 10th. You're going to hold it over to the 14th. Male lamb, spotless lamb, lamb of the first year. Specific. You're going to hold it over four days. You're going to kill it between the two evenings. You see, and you're going to kill it by piercing it in the side. You're going to let the blood drain out in a basin. You're going to take the blood that's in that basin and strike the top lintel, the two side posts dipping from a basin, bringing forth four points of blood down there in the land of Egypt on the inside of their door. Now, you see, that lamb had to be roasted with fire. It, they had to have it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And they had to eat it in haste with their kneading boards on their backs, their lawn skirted, and their shoes on their feet. Because they were getting ready to come up out of bondage that night. Now, you see, with Yahshua the Messiah, you see, we had a lamb that was taken out on the 10th and held over till the 14th. Yahshua coming in on the 4,000th four, 4, year or the fourth day. You see, he was carefully examined. Pilate didn't find no fault in him. Now, you see, he ate the Passover the evening of the 14th with his disciples. Now, 
The 14th started at 6 o'clock that evening and went till 6 o'clock the next evening. Okay, so now he is carefully examined. They didn't find any fault in him. He was put on the cross about nine o'clock in the morning, you see, that blood is, is being drained out of that body. You see, now it's going to go dark from 12 to 3, but we're still in the 14th. That's still the 14th. That lamb had to be killed on the 14th. They were coming up out of bondage. You see, so now with our lamb down there in the land of Egypt, they ate it roast with fire, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. The death angel goes through the land of Egypt and kills the firstborn of both man and beast. And the scriptures tell us there was not a house of the Egyptians where there was not one dead. There was a great cry down there in the land of Egypt that night, you see. And they were urgent about getting the children of Israel out of that because they said, we're going to be all dead men. So now, oh, Yahshua is down there with the land in the land of Egypt to get the children of Israel out of that physical bondage. Yahshua, the Messiah, on that cross, you see, now, Yahshua had to be placed on that cross. There's a, he said that he was the door. Now, you had to have blood on that door. You had a crown of thorns thrust on his head, nail prints in his right hand and in his left, a nail going through his feet. You see, four points of blood there. Now, you see, this is, is such a beautiful thing. I mean, Yahshua gives us all the witnesses that we need to, to be assured of his ability to deliver. That's his purpose. Nobody is going to take that away from him. That is his purpose, deliverance. So now, you see, when he was betrayed, it was in a garden. Now, Adam... When he partook of that fruit, and you know what? We only know what happened to Adam by the means of a divine vision and revelation that was given to Moses atop that mount there where he saw the whole genealogies of man, you see. And through a divine vision and revelation, Yahshua once again at the end of this age comes and to in and delivers those whom he had chosen. Because the previous speaker was having uh, John the 17th chapter. And when Yahshua is offering up that prayer, he said that he wasn't praying for, for those that Yahweh had purpose for him to have there, but all those who would believe on him, Yahshua the Messiah, through their teaching or through their preaching. He was doing that for, that, that prayer was offered up for us too. Now that's some intercession being made because he is the only intercessor between Yahweh and man. Yahshua is it. And he is offering up that prayer. He was going to give up his body. That blood. The body was going to be consumed. But the blood 
was necessary. You see, because when Adam partook of that fruit in the garden, the blood went to the four corners of the earth. I mean, we were all dead. We were all under con that condemnation. So he's betrayed in a garden and they have to hang him on a cross. You see, Adam lost his life for that fruit that was on that tree. You see, and so where Adam died, Yahshua picked him up. But now with the, when we go back to the children of Israel, Yahshua leads them a three-day journey to and through the divided waters of the Red Sea. And they go through that Red Sea as it tunneled up. And they went through on dry ground. And the Egyptian who attempted to pursue them, they drowned there in the Red Sea. So now you see, Yahweh was with them the whole time. He never left them. He never gave up on them. They gave up on him plenty of times, but he, and he never gave up on them. You see, he had them in the wilderness of Sinai. He gave them laws, judgments, and ordinances. He gave them a tabernacle pattern. He showed Moses an intangible pattern up in the mount that was a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. Now, that was going to teach us something about him because he is pure spirit that took on shape and form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim, and then manifest in a physical and fleshly body as Yahshua the Messiah. Three states of existence, two manifestations, but it's the self-same spirit in operation. And he gave Moses specific instructions on the tabernacle, 33 days worth. Uh, specific instructions and you know what we only know that it was 33 days Moses was not aware of time because John told us on, on from his vision on the Isle of Patmos there was no night there he's looking at the operation of the priest in the tabernacle that said in the evening, he goes in and he lights the lampstand. In the morning, he puts it out. So in the evening and the morning were the first day and the second day and the third day. That's how Moses is telling time is by the operation of the tabernacle. And that's how we look at what's going on in this creation because it's Yahweh's greater and more perfect tabernacle. And we can look at the sign of the time. The previous speaker said, we don't have long in this. The gospel is being preached, is being preached all the time. We hear it even in the news. You look at all the depth. And the burials. And you know what? There's going to be a resurrection. We're looking at our seasons change. You know, we have a fall, a winter, a spring, and a summer. All of this is showing us Yahshua's death, his burial, and his resurrection. He is preaching his gospel to his whole creation is preaching it. But to those whom he had chosen before the foundation of the world, those are the ones who will hear it. You see, and, you know, sometimes it seems like he's screaming it. Why, you know, why don't you pay attention? But he still speaks with us in that still small voice. And he lets us know that he's at the door 
and he's knocking. And if we open up, he will come in and he will sup with us and we will sup with him. He's here and he's doing it for us. You see, with the children of Israel in the land, in the wilderness of Sinai, for 40 years he suffered them. You see, he had spies to go out and spy out the land. Now he told them that they were going to inherit this land. And then some people came back and says, well, they, there's giants over there. And and we can't we can't do that. And two people, Caleb and, and Joshua, and you see, Joshua is actually Joshua. So you had really one true witness of those that were born, you know, in Egypt. And he's saying, you know, if Yahweh say we can have it, let's go get it. But they they didn't want to do that. And Yahweh caused them to stay a year for a day. For the 40 days that they went out to spy out the land, they had to stay a year in the wilderness of Sinai. And what happened is Joshua killed off, Yahweh killed off that generation and it was their children who they're saying who they said that the giants of it in Canaan's land would kill their children well it was their children that went over to inherit Canaan's land but now whilst they were in the wilderness like I said he gave them laws he gave them judgments he gave them ordinances and he knew they couldn't keep that law they had a tabernacle where the priests worked they worked every day they were they were constantly burning sacrifices you see and with all of that he told them that if they could do it then, you know, they would get their, they would be able to have inherit their own salvation, or I'm saying that wrong, but um, let's see, how, how does it go? Um, if you could do it, does anybody know where that is? Can we read it? The righteous it's, I think it's in Exodus, the 20th chapter, maybe. Exodus. I have in Deuteronomy 6 and 25, Doc. Okay, and can it, you read that for me? Uh, and it shall be our righteousness. Okay. If we yep, observe to do all these commands before Yahweh, our Elohim, as he mm -hmm. had commanded us. Okay, so now, thank you very much for finding that. It, it's in Deuteronomy. And it would be their righteousness if they could do it. Well, they couldn't do it, you know. And that was a given because he knew that they would not be able to keep that law. He wrote in tables of stone while Moses was up in the mount the second time. When he called Moses out of that mount because he heard a noise of war in the in the land or on the bottom of the mount there, they had built that golden calf. Well, Moses hadn't seen yet what happened in the garden with the transgression. So 
he was upset with the children of Israel. He threw those stones down and they broke. You see, now Yahshua is teaching. He is constantly teaching us. You see, that law that he gave them in the wilderness of Sinai was not going to, they were not going to be able to keep that law. They did not have what it took in them to be able to keep that law. So now they have to go through that 40 years there in the wilderness of Sinai. He takes them, he allows Moses to see what Canaan's land looks like. And he puts Moses to sleep atop Mount Nebo. And they have 30 days to mourn Moses. And Joshua takes him, or Joshua takes him over the River Jordan. He gives them specific instructions on how to go through the River Jordan. What would cause that water to tunnel up, you see, was those priests that had to go in. And when the heels of their feet touch the, the water, it would tunnel up. And the children of Israel went through again on dry ground, going with the, the priest there in the center, holding the Ark of the Covenant. And they go through the Jordan River. You see, Yahshua had them take out those 12 stones to commemorate that spot where they cross over the River Jordan. So now you see, when Lucifer is trying to get Yahshua to turn stones into bread and Yahshua is telling him man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh from Yahweh. You see, all of those things Yahshua is teaching us through the means of a divine vision and revelation. You see, he had mercy on us down here at the end of this age so that we can see those things that he has marked there in the scriptures to tell us about himself and his purpose and how he delivered. He delivered the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He delivered them out of the wilderness of Sinai. He gave them Cana's land. They had uh, vineyards that they didn't plant. They had houses that they didn't build. He gave them everything. And if you want to be honest with yourself, just, just look at yourself sometime and be honest. The things that he gave you that really matter, he, he's given them to you freely. He gave them to you. You didn't do anything to earn that. We did not do anything to earn the mercy and the grace he has bestowed upon us down here at the end of this age. You see, he purposed it before the foundation of the world that he would cause us to hear him and how he has the ability to deliver us. How is that happening? It's through the preaching of his gospel, the preaching of his death, his burial, and his resurrection according to the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. You see, we have to see how it was. Five minutes. Five, Five minutes. minutes. Okay, thank you. We have to see how it was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you see, and that death decree, and them being thrown into that fiery furnace, but Yahshua was right there with them. And the one who caused the furnace to be heated up so hot that he killed his mighty men, he could go in there and identify Yahshua. And when he called them out, it was just those three that came out.
You see, but Yahshua was right there with them. Brethren, he is right here with us today, delivering us every single day out of every happenstance. You see, whether we entered it ignorantly or not, he is right here in us to cause us to see him delivering. All kinds of things are happening on the news. You can't get nothing. I mean, it's just a mess everywhere, every country, every language. It's just coming apart at the seams. But he's still preaching his gospel. Say, so yes, that's happening. And it's all about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, his spirit in me. You see, that's what it took to have his spirit in me. The preaching of that gospel that caused me to have some faith, some confidence in his ability to deliver. He has, he is going to do this. He has given us an inheritance. You see, it's already been done. He's shown us what it looks like. Just hang in here. It, we don't have long. But however long it is, let's hold one another up. Let's love one another. And, and just keep preaching this gospel, brethren. Just keep preaching this gospel. All praise, honor, and glory go to Yahshua the Messiah, our Savior. Hallelujah. 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 For our next speaker, we'd like to call on Dr. Deborah Williams. If you're there, you're on mute. All right, for our next speaker, we'd like to call on Dr. Tennille Williams. Good, good evening. I was going to say good afternoon. Good evening, class. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the remarks of the um, last few speakers that we had this evening. Everything that was brought forth, you could definitely know there was definitely from Joshua the Messiah, um, they really went through everything from uh, Moses all the way down to today. The story of Moses or the event of Moses um, coming forth out of um, Egypt into uh, the wilderness and back to perform uh, Yahweh's business because um, he was used as that, um, as that vessel to bring that children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then um, in bringing them back over through, well, we won't say over, back through um, the Red Sea to worship Yahweh there at Mount Sinai and to get that, that law that was prepared specifically for them um, and um, so that they could marry Yahweh there at, that, um, at the mountain there at Mount Sinai. Now, the one thing that we definitely, especially living in this day and time, want to take um, from the events of, of Moses and children of Israel, and even after they've made it past through the wilderness and even um, going into the promised land, which of course they had been promised from uh, times before, was to make sure that we today are, are keeping faith, as that uh, first speaker was talking about, making sure that we keep faith and, and keep a strong hope and belief um, and faith in Yahshua the Messiah. We see from the um, events of the children of Israel, how they had seen the signs and wonders that was um, those uh, plagues that were put on um, by Yahshua the Messiah um, on the, um, the uh, Egyptians. Um, those 
signs and wonders were not just for the Egyptians. And I think that's important to remember. It was also for the Israelites so that it could also build up their faith and to know that they needed a savior um, and to know that they also had a comforter. And that same is that same true for us today. We have a comforter. Can we get the scripture uh, that, that about the comforter, if you don't mind? John um, 14, go ahead. And 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And that's exactly what happened for those um, Israelites that were down there in the land of Egypt. It, you, even if you look at um, that Exodus in the third chapter where he was, Moses was given that name. Um, the first speaker talked about how, you know, Yahweh made it clear as to who he was and what he was there for. He let him know that he was uh, the, the Elohim of his forefathers. So he had that introduction. He brought back to his remembrance because I'm almost certain that he had heard from his parent, his mother, you know, this is where we're from because he learned, he was raised and, and nursed um, by his mother up to a certain point. And then I uh, grew up the rest of his years um, in the house of Pharaoh. So he knew that he was not an Egyptian. He was, he was being told and those, those stories and whatnot had been passed down from generation to generation, just like today. We pass um, heirlooms and things down from generation to generation. It's the same thing that happened um, back then. So he knew who the Elohim of his forefathers were. So he, Yahweh made that introduction. Um, he gave him uh, faith and uh, a surety and to know that who he was speaking to was of great importance and this this uh, entity that he was talking to was was real and true and that he wasn't delusional. I know sometimes people, um, when they have um, different types of uh, uh, visions or things happen, they almost feel like they're delusional and that they shouldn't be seeing these things or they shouldn't be talking about things or they shouldn't know things that are happening or that are, are, are going to happen. But we can see just from uh, the interaction between Moses, um, even Abraham, um, uh, Noah, those interactions, those uh, personal and interactions between them and Elohim, he will let you know what to do, what's going on, what's going to happen, so that you don't feel like, you know, this is this shouldn't be happening, or maybe I shouldn't know this, or maybe I shouldn't do this. He will direct you, just like he directed Moses. He told him exactly what to do, and he let him know, like the second speaker said, I will be with you. I am going to be your comforter. I'm going to be the one that's going to be running the show. You just do what I ask you to do, and I promise you I will be there with you. The same today. All he asks is that we preach uh, this gospel, and that was uh, brought out in our um, scripture lesson, too. Um, in Ephesians, Philippians, chapter. Hey, I'm sorry, Philippians, <laughs> first chapter. Yeah, Mark. Philippians first chapter. Philippians first chapter. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Doctor. Paul, and Timotheus. Servants of Yahshua the Messiah to all the sons in Yahshua the Messiah, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from Yahweh our Father and from the Savior Yahshua the Messiah. I thank my Elohim upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel mm -hmm. from the first day until now. A reverse. Yeah, read verse six for me, Dr. Dan, I'm sorry. Verse six, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you We'll perform it until the day of Yahshua, the Messiah. Notice that he said the good work in you, that he will perform in you. So a lot of times we 
we feel like we are running the show when we are not. We are not running the show. Just like back then in, uh, in, in the days of Moses and the Israelites, Moses was not the one that brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but you kind of get the feeling that that's the way it happened from watching the movie, or even if you were told that when you were growing up or things like that, it, it wasn't Moses. It was Yahweh who did that. It was his working. He was working through Moses to deliver his people, not Moses's people, his people out of the land of Egypt. This is according to his purpose. We always say that this, the, the things that happen in this Bible, they testify to Yahshua the Messiah. They don't testify to you. This was not written as a, uh, uh, to give you an example of, of, of how to walk every day. That's not what this was about. This was to testify to Yahshua the Messiah and to build your faith in Yahshua the Messiah and to build your faith that no matter what, Yahweh is, has the reins and he knows what he's doing. So no matter what the situation may be, whether it be good, whether you be put in a tight spot, whether it be a situation where you feel like you're not going to get out of it, Yahweh is always going to be there and he's watching just like he was down there. Uh, in the land of Egypt, he said, I've seen the oppression of my people. I have witnessed it. He was down there. He is with us in us, making sure that that path that we are on, that we stay straight. We need to ask him for that faith. Just like Paul said, he was happy that they had the grace. He was to them that grace be unto you and peace. That same grace and peace we want to have even today, especially today with everything going on. I swear, every time I turn on the news, or not even when I turn on the news, every time I get off work and I call my husband on the way home from work, the first thing he says was, didn't you see that? Did you see this on the news today? And I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened this time? These things were prophesied that were, were going to happen. But because we have this gospel, we should be able to hold on to this and even though it may be depressing and it may be scary, we should be almost be happy in the aspect that we know that the end is coming. We know there's going to come a point where we are not going to have to deal with this. And we shouldn't be surprised because these things were already foretold that these things were going to happen. All of these things that happened to the children of Israel um, were all foretold that those things were going to happen. They were told they were going to end up in a land where they were going to be easily entreated. They didn't know how they were going to get down there. But they ended up down there, just as it was said uh, to Abraham. They knew they were going to be resurrected up out of the land of Egypt. They didn't know when, they didn't know how, but it happened. They needed to keep that faith and they needed to have that faith. Even un There was a part in here where Paul talks about even unto death. Let me see if I can find it. He was further down in the chapter. Um, uh, here we are, series. Um, nope, nope, nope. Um, verse... Uh, let's start at verse 19. Philippians 1.19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Yahshua, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Yahshua shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Mm -hmm. uh, and continue to read, Dr. Dye, for me. For to me to live is Yahshua, and to die is gain. Mm hmm but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Yahshua the Messiah, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy in faith. So here and it is. So, we can stop right there. I'm sorry, Dr. Dye. 
So here it is. He's saying, at least the interpretation, I, I, when I read it, the first thing I thought was, no matter what the situation is, whether, like he said, whether it be to, to life or to death, he wanted to make sure, whatever the situation, that he was glorifying Yahshua Messiah. He was making sure that it wasn't going to be about him, that all things done through that body, through that vessel, was to bring glory to Yahshua Messiah. Same today, whether how we walk, how we how we talk, um, the things that we do, the things that we say, um, just the way that we carry ourselves should always bring glory and honor to Yahshua the Messiah. People will look at us and say that we're weird. <laughs> They'll say that we're weird. They'll say we don't know what we're talking about. They may say what we say may sound ridiculous, but you know what? They also said that to Noah. They, they, they thought he was ridiculous. A boat? Are you kidding me? A boat for what? Rain? It's never rain. But here it is, Noah and his family, they followed those directions. They built that ark that was given um, directions from Yahweh himself, and they preserved themselves alive. The same for us today, holding on to that gospel, um, that death, that burial of Yahshua the Messiah, not taking it for granted, paying heed to the signs that are um, being shown to us every day, whether it be through the news, whether it be um, through interactions at work, things that may have happened to us. And just remember that even with the good, we have to accept the bad as well. Those Israelites, they were down there in that land of Egypt being evilly entreated all those years. I'm sure that they were probably like, oh my goodness, we are never going to get out of here. But you had to keep that faith. And remember that through all things, through the good, through the bad, even the situation, um, if you think about um, Paul, Paul himself, he was a persecutor of Yahweh's people. Who would have thought that Yahweh could use him to be a vessel to preach his gospel? Of all the people that could be used, he used him. So it just goes to show having that faith and that it is by grace there's no work that you can do um, to, as they say, win your right to heaven, as they say in the church world, get to, go ahead and donate this money so you can get those tokens up to heaven. It doesn't work like that. It's through grace that he allows you. And it's only to those who he has chosen. Can we get that scripture that says, um, I, I, you don't choose him, he chooses you. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, mm -hmm. but I have chosen you mm -hmm. and ordained you mm -hmm. that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, notice that he said that we don't choose him. He chooses us and that what he's asking us to do is bring forth fruit. That was the same commandment that was given to um, Adam and Eve to bring forth fruit. Um, that was the same commandment that was given uh, to Noah um, once they uh, were resurrected, up, it came up out of that ark. They were to um, be fruitful. The same today, we will bring forth fruit, but our fruit that we bring forth um, through the Ashwood Messiah is uh, the spiritual fruit, not a phys not something physical. Everything now is a, is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. We want to make sure that this gospel that we received, just like Dr. Kinley did, he gave it to all of us unadulterated and gave us many avenues in which to be able to lay our hands and, and our eyes on this gospel. We have these charts, we have our pamphlets, we have our, our, our study books. Um, we have almost everything accessible to us, even through this pandemic, not even being able to go to class, we still have these Zoom classes where we have access to our brethren who are willing and able um, to deliver the gospel through Yahshua Messiah to us each and every day. And somebody was talking about, you can go to class um, two or three times a day if you choose it. And you can now with the way things are now, you have access to doing that. 
And how we receive that gospel should be the same way that we give that gospel. We should be giving it unadulterated, pure as we received it. So as to make sure that um, we are giving all glory and honor to Yahshua Messiah. Just like those um, forefathers of the, of the children of Israel, they passed on um, what uh, the El Shaddai, because that's what they knew uh, Yahweh is at that time, what he had done for them. Just the name El Shaddai, Almighty Provide, uh, Almighty Provide, he provided for them, even though they didn't know their name. Even today, he provides for us. Even though we have the name now, he provides for those. And there are still some that may have still not um, come in contact with the gospel yet. He is providing for them to bring them into class. And it may be through one of us that may be on, on these calls. So when we are put in the position to deliver that gospel, we want to make sure that uh, we are not inverting any of our own concept theories or imaginations uh, into those. And that we ask Joshua to help us to deliver that gospel. Uh, Paul did a great job of delivering uh, that gospel that he was giving, changed all of his previous thoughts and concepts of how he felt about uh, Yahweh's people, which definitely um, he really had to like pretty, I'm sure lay it on thick to get people to understand that yes, he was doing Yahweh's work at that point. He wasn't there um, um, to, to kill them really initially um, at this point. Um, he did a great job of making himself lower than them to show proof that he was really doing Yahweh's work. And he did it unto death. He did it consistently, earnestly, and diligently, the same way we need to do today. Our focus should be on this gospel because what's going on in the world right now, it is very easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to get under the, the nick of things and to lose that faith, just like those children of Israel made it to the, the foot of that um, or at the top of that Red Sea. And they started to lose faith and wanted to go back to the way to the thing, way things were before, even though they had been tormented and whatnot, they longed um, for the um, the amenities that they had down there in the land of Egypt. We don't want to be like that. We want to make sure that we're on that that straight and that that narrow road, not the wide road, but the narrow road where you got to kind of step over this so that you don't get trapped by this or turn. Uh, to the right or to the left to keep from running into uh, another obstacle. We want to make sure that our focus and we're keeping our eye on Yahshua the Messiah. Um, so I really didn't have very much to say tonight, but I thoroughly, 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 it was very encouraging, enjoyed the remarks of the last two speakers and class has definitely been very edifying tonight. Um, so if you received anything from that, all honor and glory go to Yahshua Messiah. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Tanil Williams. Uh, I'm going to, with the last 10 minutes we got, I'm going to open it up for testimony. You know what, I'll, I'll, I'll give a small thing. So, you know, I work in the dental field. Uh, this is Tanil. I work in the dental field and, you know, we, I come across quite a few, an array of different people, different ages, um, different nationalities. Um, I really am like deep in the um, community when it comes to working in the dental field. And I always find it, even though you, you see, you see Yashua working even in the most unopportune times. And the fact when you come into this gospel, there you're all, we're always told that there should be a change. There should be people should be able to see something in you that maybe you don't even see, but they should notice that, that something good has is in you. I was doing um, a procedure for a lady the other day, and she was real nervous. I, every time she comes in the dental office, she's super super nervous. Um, and this time, I haven't seen her in a long time because now I've started to travel quite a bit for work. So I was back in my home office after being gone for quite some time and she was getting some work done, quite a bit of work done. So I take her to the back and I explain what we're going to do and, you know, take her blood pressure and all this. And 
Um, she's sitting in the chair. Of course, I have the TV on so that she can kind of calm down and watch TV. And I'm standing behind her and setting up things. And she says to me, and mind you, we're not looking at each other at this point because I'm standing behind her. She says to me, she says, so um, what church do you go to? Now, the funny thing is, all of my older patients ask me this all the time. They want to know what church you go to. You want to come to my church. Um, we're having this um, this festival for this, or we're having this festival for that. And I'd want you to come, bring your kids, yada, yada, yada. So I thought this was going to be kind of the same scenario. So I, I said to her, I said, well, you know, I, I don't go to church. Um, however, I do attend a Bible class. Um, but right now, because of the pandemic, we're doing it through Zoom. So it's really nice. We kind of do it three times a week. I said, it's really good since we're not actually meeting in a building anymore. And so she said, oh, okay, that's nice. And then she got quiet. So I figured that was going to be the end of the conversation. So then like not even maybe two minutes later, she says, you know, it's always nice to be in the room with somebody who has the spirit. And I said to myself, hmm, the spirit. So of course I stop what I'm doing and I kind of just lay my hands on the table because usually when something like that happens, I know Yashua is about to do something. So I start to get the chills and I start looking around and I'm like, okay, something's about to be said or something's about to happen. And I said to her, I said, well, yeah, it, it really is. It, it is to be in the room with somebody who has the spirit. You're right about that. She says, you know, you have a really good spirit about you. And I said, I do. And she said, yeah. She said, I feel so comfortable in here with you today. She said, I have been so nervous about this procedure. She said, but there's something about you. I am just so calm and so relaxed. She said, I trust everything that you're going to do to me today. And she just laid back in the chair and she closed her eyes. And I was like, oh my goodness. It is amazing to be, for people to be able to see Yashua in you. They can feel it. They may not know what it is, but they can feel it. And it all, when that stuff like that happens, it always reassures me that Yashua is with me. And that he directs every, my every step. And throughout the whole procedure, she was calm. She was relaxed. And we were in that procedure. I swear it had to be like three hours. But she trusted me to do what I needed to do. Um, was able to get through the procedure with no hiccups. Um, anytime that she needed a break, like she just really, really did. She did a lot better than I had anticipated her to do. But I thank Joshua that he allowed me to be able to be there to walk her through the process. And that he allowed her to see just a little bit of Yashua in me. And I, I really appreciate that. And it really made my day the other day. So that's why I just wanted to share with the class. Hallelujah. We get Romans the eighth chapter. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. I am Rom, Romans 8 and, uh, and 1. <laughs> Read something, Dave. It was one of the trying yeah. to sit down and try to read one. I can't remember what it was. It was something about law, spirit versus science of mind. And you have to consider, and I'll read those transcripts back in the day. I've read a lot of them. And the point was, what happens is when we come into this school, we have no idea what those scriptures mean and what the interpretation are. Now, it takes one with the Holy Spirit to make an interpretation of what those scriptures mean. So we know that the founder had the Holy Spirit, or we say it was Yahshua and him that had it. So he says some things, but read that, read that a little bit. Okay. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Yahshua the Messiah. Now there's walk. no condemnation to them that are in Yahshua the Messiah. Well, how did you get in to understand into his body? Well, in order to be a member of the body of Yahshua the Messiah, which is the church of assembly, he has to give you the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit is the comfort is going to open up your understanding concerning the scriptures, the Old Testament, of what's in the law and the prophets, how it was testifying to him. Go ahead. Who walk not after the flesh, but after now, the Now, when we talk about not walking after the flesh, now Israel came out through the wilderness, from Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai, and they received cardinal ordinances. So that Adam received a cardinal ordinances, you know, he was told to be fruitful and multiply. You understand that he could eat from the trees of the 
garden, but not from the fruit of the trees of knowledge of good and evil. Read on. For the law of the spirit of life in Yahshua the Messiah. Now we're talking about the law of the spirit of life that's in Yahshua the Messiah. See, now everybody died from the fall of Adam, and it was in Yahshua that we were going to see eternal life or enter into his kingdom. Go ahead. Hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, the cardinal ordinances, as we're told, was typical of the law of sin and death. Read. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, mm -hmm. Yahweh sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, what he went into, now the, the found I was reading about, he went over the same thing, unity of the spirit, father, word, holy spirit, peace, clear one. But he talked about Yahweh and his purpose, and he talked about him being universal spirit of law. You understand? And we talk about man having consciousness or a soul. And we talk about man, and he talked about the man's mind. You understand? And what he said, he said that you know that you can change your mind. You understand? Now, we refer to that as consciousness or the mind. You could change your mind. So you have the ability, as we talk about sometimes, Yahweh has a purpose that's not going to change because he's spirit and spirit don't change. But then he said, talking about science of mind, he said that you can change your mind. You understand? You see what I'm saying? So when it now, as far as law of spirit was concerned, that man, no matter what he did, was going to have to come down and be fruitful and multiply. Now, he told them of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil don't eat of that, right? Because right. in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So you, you could go to all. Now, there was multiple trees out there, and he planted those trees in the garden that was good for food. So he had his choices. See, in his mind, he could choose whatever he desired to eat. You get the point? You yep. see? So he could change his mind if I'm going to have an orange, an apple, a banana, I'm going to have coffee, tea, or, or ice cream, or whatever you want to eat. And you could switch that. So in the sense that he had ability, he did. So the wife say, hey, you know, if those trees are good, and the devil told her maybe this tree is good too to make wise. You understand? So she decided in her mind, you understand, that she would partake of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, although she, see, she were not supposed to. So she had the ability to choose or change her mind. But law of spirit or spirit never changes. It governs the universe. It governs nature. It governs everything. Now, what Yah? Now that's the will of Yahweh and the purpose of Yahweh. And then he goes on and say, "Well, you know, if you jump off the Empire State Building, I'm just saying that." He said, "You jump off a building and it's too high for you, you could die." People decide on that, but see, because you got the law of spirit in place, you got gravity. If you jump off, if you do something. That's other than how Yahweh has purposed the thing in nature to react, you could die if you get the point. So he said, spirit doesn't change. You get the point? You understand? And that the purpose of Yahweh is not going to change. But you can change your mind. You understand? You can decide if you're going to go to class or, or you're not. You get the point. You're going to do this or you're going to do that. See? But the law of spirit never changed. That's the purpose and plan of Yahweh. And, the, and so he said, and then he talks about the same thing he talks about in the textbooks. He talks about uh, universal mind, conscious mind, and subconscious mind. He said no such a thing. See, so there's a difference between what then we were to referring to the will of Yahweh. You understand? That wouldn't change, which pertains to his purpose. You understand? And your mind that you could change. Okay, that's pretty much what I want to say. Let's say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, well, that concludes class for the day. These classes operate by free will donations. Anybody desiring to make a donation, please see the treasurer, Dr. Todd Renshaw. Um, may we bow our hearts and minds with doxology. 
Doxology is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude and goes as follows. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and all times. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Oh, great class. Good class. It was.